Well, we're going to end it in a good way, I think, building a strategic PMO, and apparently it actually worked well. Work together and put it together, and they work together and put the presentation together, and they got the All right. All right. Thank you, sir. All this project management stuff, it's just a waste of time. <laughs> I actually heard, oh, thank you. I actually heard that comment uttered by someone who, ironically enough, had three project managers reporting to them. Uh, I've heard some other doozies uh, in my day. Uh, we don't need a change manager. I'll handle the change management myself. If people don't want to change, we'll just fire them. <laughs> uh, this was said by a program manager on an SAP project. Uh, that project went over time about 50% and over budget about double. Um, a lot of problems with change management led to that. Uh, we have a solid project management process. Uh, that was said by a senior executive to the board about two years before he came back to the same board to explain why a project he was running was forecasted to be 400% over budget. And one of my favorites, this was actually said by the boss of the we don't need a change manager guy. I know how to stop adding consultants. I'll just stop buying tables. They won't have anywhere to sit. <laughs> so I don't know if he actually said it exactly like this, but that is absolutely what he did. Um, so uh, Eric and I have a much more enlightened view on uh, project and program management that we want to share with you today. Um, a few things. Oh, actually, Eric, you want to? Sure. So a uh, few things we want to accomplish today. First, we want to share a little bit, a little uh, success story about Holly Frontier in Dallas. Nelson will do that. Um, how Holly Frontier went through the process of establishing a successful PMO function. Share some war stories along the way to help uh, add some context and some lessons learned. From A.T. Carney's perspective, we'll share about how clients think about it and how a lot of the things that Holly Frontier did uh, is consistent with our view overall and just broadly discuss tools and practices that we feel are necessary for success. All right, so uh, we have uh, 60 minutes plus questions, so I figured we might, might as well get to know each other a little bit, right? So this is my bio on a slide. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, I think it's that side, uh, you'll notice a steaming uh, plate of barbecue. I love to cook barbecue, I love to eat barbecue, I love to serve barbecue. I love to, love to cook, serve, and eat barbecue at tailgates before college football games or just about any time. Uh, it's a passion of mine. What's the best Texas barbecue, Nelson? So uh, <laughs> there, there's actually a book about this, and uh, I think it's called The Prophets of Barbecue. And <laughs> I like the East Texas style uh, over like the Central Texas style. East Texas style relies a little bit more on the sauce than the Central <laughs> Texas style. So thank you for asking. Uh, as you can see, uh, with the big block ATM there, I'm a proud graduate of Texas A&M University. I saw a few Aggies out there in the hallways today. Uh, we are part of the best football conference in the nation, uh, the Southeastern Conference. Uh, actually, Eric is also part of the Southeastern Conference, you'll learn in a second. Uh, but I also have to give some love to the Comets. Uh, when I moved to Dallas about nine years ago, I started coming up here once or twice a year uh, for a role I have with an uh, uh, educational foundation. And I got to meet the administrators, and I got to meet some of the faculty, and I got to meet the students. And I'll tell you what, the administrators here have a great vision. They have one of the best faculties in the state here at UTD. And the students are top notch. In fact, uh, when we look for interns for Holly Frontier IT, uh, we only come to UTD. So we've been doing that for about three years. Um, so after A&M, I came, uh, I went to uh, Ernst & Young in their consulting practice. I learned a little software package called SAP. Uh, if any of you guys have heard of that, I remember I graduated with a liberal arts degree and my boss called me and said, hey, we want to send you to this SAP Academy. It's going to take five weeks. Is that okay? And my first thought was, I don't know that I can say no to this. <laughs> the second thought was, what software could possibly take five weeks to learn? <laughs> and uh, it took me about two years before I finally realized or uh, 
got good enough to feel like I was adding value with SAP. But uh, anyway, Cap Jim and I purchased the consulting practice from Ernst & Young in the early 2000s uh, and then dropped the uh, Ernst & Young Young, Ernst & Young off the name and became Cap Gemini. So that's where I was when I, in 2005, I was the first consultant out on the Holly Corporation project to implement SAP. Um, and in 2007, we went live, and that's when I was hired uh, to be the vice president for IT for Holly. In 2011, Holly and Frontier merged to become Holly Frontier. Uh, and so that's where I'm at today. Uh, now in the bottom, uh, your right, my left, I think, uh, you see a picture of a DJ spinning vinyl. A little known fact about me is that I love to, uh, I used to be a DJ, um, mostly as a hobby, uh, mostly as an amateur, but uh, I still uh, like to spin the vinyl. I just did it a couple weekends ago with some buddies of mine. I don't, I don't use the, well actually I shouldn't say I don't use, I can use the more digital tools, but I really like to do this with the actual old vinyl and real record players, so. <laughs> we have a music, a music aficionado back there. So uh, that says a lot about me, but the most important thing to me is my family. Um, I have a beautiful family, my wife Melissa. You see there our uh, baby daughter Kate, that was at her baptism. She is now seven months old, and we have a boisterous son named Jack who is two and a half. Uh, being a father can be like being a project manager. Uh, you try to keep an even keel and keep things looking nice even when it's really chaos <laughs> all around you. So that's Jack. Uh, so quick project management bio before I turn it back over to Eric. My first project was in 1998 uh, with Shell Chemical. We were upgrading uh, their SAP platform from R2 to R3 and I developed training content for that project. And my lesson learned was I wanted to get deeper technical skills so I could get better roles on future projects. Um, my first experience with project management was 2000 uh, with British Petroleum at the time, uh, now known as BP. It was when they were, um, just before they acquired Amico and, and were integrating all that into one company. Um, I went out there to solve a problem they were having with their pricing interface. So, the system that set prices at the gas stations where you go to pick up the gas wasn't quite working, which can be a little bit of a problem for a company like BP. And uh, we fixed the interface. We actually paid for the project four times over with invoice errors that we found and were able to collect on. And uh, lesson learned from that was, uh, I would say just to really listen and learn because we came out there to solve a, pr a problem and we didn't know how to do it at first, so we just talked to people, and we just listened and wrote down notes. Um, my favorite project, Eric has a much better favorite project than mine, uh, than me, but uh, my all-time favorite project was 2002. I left BP and went to ConocoPhillips uh, to solve another problem. They were merging, ConocoPhillips and Tosco were all merging into one company, and they had about 20 different processes for customer master data intake and they needed a, a streamlined process. So we ended up building a custom tool inside their SAP platform to uh, use workflow and go through the process of getting this data set up. Uh, it was a team of about four or five. Uh, the reason I love this project is because we were so successful. SAP actually recognized uh, what we built, it was called Masterminder, as one of the two best practices in that landscape. Um, also, uh, it's still in use today, so not all software applications survive 14 years <laughs> these days, so I'm very proud of that fact. And then finally, my last role was when I came to Holly to help implement SAP. Um, that was in 2005, and the rest they say is history. Lesson learned here was this was when I made the transition from consulting into uh, actually doing real stuff, sorry Eric, <laughs> just joking, just joking. Made my transition from consulting into industry and uh, had a lot of fear and trepidation about that. And so I, I would say, you know, don't be afraid to get outside your comfort zone. All right. So uh, by way of educational background, uh, undergrad at Vanderbilt, um, where I uh, learned mechanical engineering and economics, no IT. Those lessons came through a professional career and as uh, Nelson mentioned, SEC, and just by way of reference to Vanderbilt's uh, sporting tradition, when <laughs> SMU came off the death penalty many, many years ago, they won one game in football, 
against <laughs> Vanderbilt. <laughs> They're a baseball school. <laughs> yeah, and a little basketball. But, um, and then uh, University of Michigan for my MBA, two uh, experiences professionally. Black and Veatch, if any of you know them, they are an engineering firm helping with a lot of utility construction. And then uh, for the last 17 years, A.T. Kearney. Now you'll notice in the upper right corner uh, a little bit of a conflict that I have personally. I grew up in Kansas City and was a Chiefs fan for a long time, but I've been almost two decades in, in, in Dallas, so I have converted. But I do have a, a kind of a shameful story in that my best man lived in Dallas many years ago when the Chiefs had a 13-3 and season, but the Kansas City Chiefs, led by Joe Montana, lost to Troy Aikman on Thanksgiving Day. <laughs> Thanksgiving Day. So that was a heartbreaker. Kind of personally, um, uh, my family originally comes from Switzerland, so we try to, to do the uh, skiing from time to time. Golf, when I can, even though professionally it, it uh, seems to, the time for it seems to be getting cut down, but my kids love to go biking. So we, we are, around the weekends, we always make a little trip out. So it's been good. And so uh, there's my family, my wife, Sarah, son, Mark, Rachel, and Anna. And then I thought, you know what, S Switzerland, we were there a couple years ago, but what says August in Texas more <laughs> than a snow-covered mountain? So I thought, I, I thought I would add that in. So my experiences, so my first job was really around uh, custom applications to help power plants run more efficiently, right? And so, and it was a good, good way for a mechanical engineer to get to learn IT. Uh, it's been a while now, but it really taught me in those first experiences the importance of the rigor and the discipline with, uh, that is involved in uh, executing project management well. My first project management leadership experience, and, and I think the, the brain science session from earlier this morning, for those of you who were in it, he talked about the difference in perspective from focus to broader, right? And in that first project management leadership uh, experience, we were doing all our tasks properly, trying to interface with a power plant control system. That power plant control system was actually serial number, serial number, number one for that new piece of equipment. <laughs> and I couldn't get anything to work, right? I thought I was doing things completely incorrectly. I thought, my, I thought my team and I were just falling apart, but it turned out it was the control system that was completely buggy and not giving us the right data. My favorite project was actually uh, for the world governing body of soccer named FIFA. I don't so, know if any of you are familiar with that. Eric, did you get any gifts while you were on this project? Well, with the press that FIFA's been getting, you would think so. Uh, but no, <laughs> unfortunately I didn't, but it's, it is a fascinating organization. The reason I put it as my favorite, it is a political organization, right? There are elections, and um, what it really taught me was, you know, so it, here you are, kind of a, a youngish IT guy trying to implement a large-scale project, and, and by the way, at this time, AT Kearney was owned by EDS, so this was an AT Kearney EDS joint project, a lot of great guys over there. But it really taught me the lesson of different agendas, different objectives, right? And having kind of a view to that business uh, priority lens that may be uh, under the surface. And so, you know, I start, came in thinking, well, they asked me to do X and I need to deliver on X. But that wasn't necessarily uh, what everybody had in mind. And so learning, kind of getting an appreciation of that and kind of really having a view into the broader stakeholder group as far as like strategic PMO goes, I think is an important lesson and important to recognize when you're in those situations. And then uh, my last most recent project uh, was a, a JV in Saudi Arabia. So basically um, fairly large construction type project the business was going from zero to rev in revenue to $8 billion in revenue. And when we came in, there were four people in IT and they needed to implement SAP, right? Uh, it was just really a, an interesting set of circumstances. Just by way of reference, AT Kearney is not a system integrator, right? So we really needed to think about what a portfolio of partners would look like. Saudi Arabia is an interesting place to work with, but, and we had a very short timeline to get things up and going. 
So it was, it was really interesting. And, and subsequent to this, I've been doing a little bit more of kind of health checks on existing programs. But a uh, nice, uh, interesting set of experiences. So um, now a question for the group. And we're going to do a, a quick bit of hand raising. So what areas of project or program management cause the most issues in the organizations you support, right? What are the top topics that you struggle with? We're asking now because I think Nelson and I can maybe shape our comments a little bit to, to hit those. Anyone? Yes? Lack of support from senior leadership in the organization. Lack of support of senior leadership in the organization. Very good one. Yes? Not enough resources. Not enough resources. Excellent. Yep. Good one as well. Business silos don't talk to each other. Business silos. That's fantastic. That Very never, good. That never happened. <laughs> one more. Anybody? Green shirt. Green. Hitting the dates on a dangerous project. Hitting the dates. All right. Then we'll, we'll do one more. Yes. Um, not able to manage the scope properly. Okay. Not yep. able to manage the scope properly. So interestingly, we have survey results, and what you're telling us does sound awfully consistent, right? Um, actually, interestingly, uh, the success of uh, the top reason, monitor uh, the transformation program and track the dates, right? I was, interestingly, just earlier this week, I was having a discussion with a senior executive who was trying to make the case that tracking interim milestones was a waste of time. Right? Well, if you want timely and on schedule delivery, it becomes difficult. Number two, which is around the commitment of top management. Again, a hugely different set of uh, 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 expectations within the organization. I think many of us know that often you get, we hear about the projects we're involved with is that's an IT project, right? The IT project is rarely, in my opinion, just an IT project. And uh, you know, I was recently uh, doing an audit on a, a big, one of, the, one of a company's largest uh, failed implementations ever. And I asked some of the senior leadership, how much time were you involved in thinking about how this would impact your business end to end? And the answer was, well, I sat in an update meeting 30 minutes every two weeks, right? No, no thought about how that would go. So, as we go through, and you can kind of peruse this list on your own, we'll, we'll try to reinforce some of these uh, uh, lessons learned and stories. Anybody here familiar with Michael Hammer, reengineering, process reengineering, the Hammer Institute, a few of you? Yeah, he had a, <clears throat> a great story about a company that succeeded uh, with a software, big software implementation. It was SAP. Uh, but uh, the CEO uh, spoke to the entire company and, and told them, his office is gonna be just down the hall from my office. And every day when I come in, I'm gonna be asking him how the project is going. And what he was doing was sending a not so subtle message to everybody else in the company that hey, you better get along or I'm gonna be hearing about it and I'm gonna be doing something about it. And I thought that was brilliant and that's exactly what you're looking for from an executive uh, support standpoint. So we'll see who was paying attention in the objectives. Anybody know what this list is? Top companies in the area, top what companies? By revenue. By revenue. Anybody else have any qualifiers? Public. I'm sorry, what? Public. Yes, top public comp companies in Dallas. Most of you uh, recognize the top names on that list. I would also venture to guess that most of you, when you walked, uh, when you came to campus today, uh, you probably never heard of Holly Frontier. Am I right about that? We're one of the best known or, or uh, best kept secrets in Dallas. <clears throat> so we're gonna change a little bit about that today. Uh, so there, there's the proof, it's the, uh, that was the top of the list of the 150 largest public companies. So what is Holly Frontier? Uh, we are a downstream refining and marketing company. Um, if you think about the entire spectrum of oil and gas, the entire supply chain, over here you have exploration production where people are drilling for oil, searching for oil, getting it out of the ground. On the other end of the spectrum you've got your uh, retail stores or your convenience stores where you fill your cars and trucks up with gasoline. We don't do either one of those things, but we do everything in between. So we buy crude either at the lease or in bulk. We bring it to our refineries, we boil it, 
We make high value gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, asphalt, and specialty lubricants. And then we sell those on the wholesale market. So that's what we do in a nutshell. Uh, we do that with five refineries that you see represented on the map behind you uh, with the blue and white boxes. There's one in Salt Lake City, Utah, Cheyenne, Wyoming, uh, southeastern Kansas, southeastern New Mexico, and Tulsa, Oklahoma. So we are all in the mid-continent of the United States. And at times in our history, that's been a really nice strategic advantage. If you guys think about where all the shale plays have been with the horizontal drilling, a lot of them are near where our refineries are located, so that gives us a access to a low-cost crude that's, that's close to our uh, facility. We also have a pipeline company uh, known as Holly Energy Partners, and they are uh, what's known as an MLP, or a Master Limited Partnership. Anybody familiar with that? So a few of you guys, it's, it's a... Uh, it's a true partnership that distributes income every quarter, and so because of that, it, as a corporation, it doesn't have to pay taxes. Uh, it works out well for logistics companies, and in our case, we set up uh, HEP as this MLP, and they operate our pipeline assets and our terminal assets. They have about 15 different terminals uh, that support the operations of our refineries. So uh, we weren't always this big, though this represents what we look like today. Um, but if you go back not too far, uh, we were much, much smaller. So this growth really started in 2009 uh, when we purchased uh, Tulsa, what we call the Tulsa West facility. Uh, and then six months later, we purchased another refinery in Tulsa from another buyer. And so with those two transactions together, we doubled in size in terms of how much crude we could boil and how much gasoline, et cetera, that we could sell. Uh, in 2011, we doubled in size again with the merger of Holly and Frontier. Um, that uh, brought us to 440,000 barrels of crude per day, where as in 2005 when I came out there, really 2009, we were at about 100,000 barrels a day. Revenue uh, during that time period grew from about 5 billion to about 20 billion, and employees uh, went from a little under 1,000 to a little over uh, 2,500. Uh, we do have a big contingent workforce, and so about 40% of our workforce are not actually employees, uh, and so we're not quite as small in terms of, of uh, headcount as we look, but we're still pretty lean and mean. Uh, you'll notice on the IT, you mentioned uh, an a, uh, IT organization with four people that was putting in SAP. Well, we were one that had about eight people that were putting in SAP. Uh, so we had to grow for that and then uh, grew along with the company. So. Uh, Basically, that story, you know, we quadrupled in size in about uh, the span of about two years. Uh, and uh, so, from my mind, for my money, I think it's one of the, one of the best Dallas success stories of a, public, of a public company. Now, that list is going to change next year. We have a few new uh, neighbors that have come into <laughs> Dallas. Uh, one of them was speaking to you this morning. Um, but it's still a good list to be on. All right. So... And now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the projects that we had related to those mergers and uh, acquisitions that I mentioned. And talk to you a little bit from a project management or program management lens uh, about these transactions. So the first one was Tulsa Westside. It was April 2009. Uh, I remember very clearly my boss called us into the boardroom and said, hey, we just bought a refinery in Tulsa. And we are going to close on it in seven weeks on June 1st. And I thought, wow, that's not a lot of time to integrate and get ready. Uh, but I felt okay. You know, a lot of these acquisitions typically come with transition services, right? The buying or the selling company will uh, process invoices or help you close your financials or report financials. Um, well, we weren't going to get any of that. Uh, the week after I was told about the acquisition, we went up to Philadelphia uh, to meet with the buyer, and they said our systems are legacy mainframe systems, uh, custom integration that's too tightly integrated. We can't just pull out one refinery. So we can't send out invoices and we can't do your financials. And then I thought, oh, wow, we have six weeks to start producing invoices out of our system. Uh, and at first, uh, I didn't know how to do it. We didn't know how to do it. Um, we brainstormed and we came up with a way for the buying company or the selling company to send us a flat file every day that we could then send out and basically process that revenue. And that bought us some time while we then loaded all the requisite data in the system to be able to run those invoices ourselves. And so uh, we were successful. In six weeks, we hit our date. Uh, we processed invoices on day one. 
And just for a matter of perspective, I don't think I'd heard of a refinery uh, being integrated into an SAP environment in less than six weeks before. Um, so that problem initially, um, you know, when you flip the problem on its side and we came up with a creative solution, uh, we really started building a capability around that quick integration. And so uh, that project taught us a lot about that. It also taught us a lot, the, the seller had not invested in this facility in about 10 or 15 years. And so you might imagine what kind of project backlog they would have in that scenario. Uh, you also might imagine that they don't have a lot of experience with projects because they haven't been doing them. And so <clears throat> we, um, we tried to implement a lab system uh, that should have taken about nine to 12 months and took four years. Uh, and uh, lesson learned there was we really should have started with some basic project management, program management uh, training for that facility. That would have shortened that uh, project at least in half, so it was only two years. Um, so let's see, so that was the Tulsa East Side, or Tulsa West Side. About six months later, uh, got called into the bosses or to the boardroom again. We'd bought the other refinery in Tulsa, the one on the east side from a different seller. Uh, this time we had three months notice, so we were feeling pretty good. We had a lot of, a lot of runway, uh, and we were uh, bolstered by the confidence of doing it uh, just a few months earlier. Uh, we were able to repeat our success, but we started noticing we're getting a lot of applications. We're getting a lot of applications building up. And so how do we start thinking about ways to standardize or rationalize those applications? And what we came up with was what you see behind me, the component business model. And so we took our business, uh, and each vertical tower represents a different part of our business. And then uh, horizontally, we differentiate between strategic, tactical, and execution. And so basically, this is our entire business uh, process on a page. And what we did is we started loading some applications on top of this and seeing where they fit. Eh, looks pretty good. Not too much overlap. So, oh, wait, that's a lot of overlap. <laughs> oh, man, it keeps going. Wow, that whole column is just uh, tripled up. What are we going to do? Whoa, there's some gaps. Uh, that, that one column in the middle is not too bad. Not too much overlap. Oh, there we go again. And so you can see from this process that we were able to get a very clear picture of where we had overlaps and where we had gaps. And so this was the first time we really started thinking about enterprise standards and enterprise applications. And it came out of just a very real need to, to not uh, have to manage this many applications. Yeah. And so <clears throat> when you start thinking about a merger context, and I think uh, the story Nelson laid out is exactly right. But uh, often uh, people are focused very much on some of the day one immediate activities. Emails got to integrate. I got need a common website. I need a way to communicate to my people. You know, I, some of the contracts, I need to make sure I can continue transacting against them. And they don't necessarily spend time planning for uh, the post-close synergy capture and complexity reduction. And in the case that Nelson laid out, if you hadn't addressed that application overlap and complexity, right, fine, businesses would have continued to run. But in a handful of years, you know, those of us in IT know that when the funds are distributed, both OPEX and CAPEX, all of a sudden people would be like, why do you cost so much to get the dollars out? And so um, the issue becomes you need to spend the time, as Holly Frontier did, in, in really looking critically at that. And often when people think uh, application rationalization or consolidation or retirement, they think about turning off applications. And that can be a tough slog, especially if your stakeholders aren't necessarily aligned. I had, I had one client that was trying to go through this process and they actually put a tombstone up outside the data center for every application they successfully <laughs> got out of the environment. And they had like eight eight out of hundreds, right? But there are other strategies that can help you get down the way, right? And so uh, the functional mapping, which uh, you know, 
It's oh, fine. Keep going. Uh, the functional mapping that was uh, done by Holly Frontier is really the way that most people look at it, right? Am I duplicating the functionality? But there's also like a lens around business value and even technical fit around, you know, do I have a contemporary portfolio that can serve my need into the future or not? And while you may not necessarily uh, consolidate and shut everything off, there are other strategies that can deliver a lot of value. Specifically, you may freeze some things, you may, uh, you may, you may do the consolidation, but you may ultimately decide that your portfolio doesn't necessarily support your future needs and you may do a replace. So you, know, you can maintain, you can freeze, you can take other types of strategies. I had one client, a uh, high-tech client, they had a lot of apps, over 20,000. And what they decided to do, if you, thought, if you think about a portfolio of 20,000 apps and you decide to go through them one at a time and get permission to turn stuff off, it takes forever, right? And in this case, the project, management spent time, project manager spent time getting his leadership on board and they agreed to do a chop the tail strategy, right? Which would mean they would uh, uh, take away access to the long tail of small apps. They didn't touch the enterprise applications. And they, had, they got the stakeholder buy-in at the leadership level, right? We talked earlier about requiring leadership support to be willing to take some noise and complaining in the system. And on an exception basis, they could turn stuff back on. But there was no real way for them to, to make a material change in the complexity of that portfolio. They needed to take some big steps. But when you get into that gray area, some of these strategies make a lot of sense. Next slide, please. Now, whenever you're, you're trying to push through a technology change like this, I think being culturally aware, especially in the context of a merger, becomes very important. Carl Jung defined these 12 kind of personality archetypes around the people you work with. And I think, at least my bias has been as an IT professional, you tend to think that everybody thinks in a similar manner as you do and that you have you know, altruistic for the greater good type motivations, but not, that may not necessarily be the case. And as you start working through some of these fairly large transformations, I think it's important to recognize the type of people you're dealing with, right? Because otherwise, you, know, you need to customize your delivery to your audience. And so if you're working with like the hero type mentality, it's always important to make sure, you know, are they throwing everything on their own back or on their team's back and potentially, you know, committing to more than that what's realistic. Or, uh, you know, explore someone who's always in the, in the brainstorming mode and you can never anchor on a decision, right? And, so, and, and I'm sure all of us have had experiences working with different types of personalities, but if you start thinking about how am I modifying my project delivery, project management, stakeholder management style relative to my extended stakeholder group, it can make a lot of difference. Eric, I was curious about the lover uh, uh, archetype. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the, the, the lover archetype, I would, um, you know, so the way I internalize that, right, is um, I, I recently was in a, uh, in, in a client environment where the leader was trying to get the organization to change. And the leader was a little bit forceful by nature, right? And the staff was very protective, the next tier staff was very protective of the juniors, right? So it became, became a kind of a little adversarial relationship because the view was, I'm protecting my people against this bad boss. Versus, I mean, great, but the, and it became a style debate instead of an outcome debate, right? And the leader was trying to push for an outcome and it was getting resistance because of style. Right, and so trying to f ma figure out how to navigate through those types of uh, differences is is, is is can be help you make um, can help you be very successful. Or and I think successful. the key with a lot of this uh, communication stuff is versatility, right? It's being able to recognize different styles that different people have, and being able to communicate to them in a way that makes sense to them, yes. right? And so I'm glad you brought culture up because that was an interesting. Uh, microcosm with the two Tulsa acquisitions. So with the first acquisition, the refinery knew very clearly that they were uh, on the market. They knew that there was a decent chance that the refinery, instead of being bought, would just be closed down and that everybody would lose their jobs. 
Um, and when we announced that we were buying that facility, you know, there was rejoicing in Tulsa. In fact, I remember to this day going up there uh, the first weekend and, and, or the first week and seeing on someone's desk a sign that said, Hallelujah, H-O-L-L-Y. <laughs> um, and so they were very, they welcomed us with open arms. They were ready, very ready for change. Uh, they knew we were going to invest in the facility. And so we didn't have a lot of change management issues with that acquisition. Now, fast forward six months to the other Tulsa acquisition, and uh, that ref refinery's management had not let them know that that refinery was up for sale. The first time they heard about it was when we had our press release announcing that we were acquiring it. And so they were not ready for the change. They, they felt uh, they were in a, a private company that was cushy and, and uh, there was a lot, of a lot of fear of the change. And so what this taught me was that, it, you know, the readiness factor is so important. So with the west side, the change was easy. With the east side, the change was a lot harder. And uh, anybody familiar with Cy Wakeman? Uh, she's a change management author, expert, uh, talks about ditching the drama. So she has a quote that I love about change management. It really kind of flipped my perspective on this uh, on its ear. And that is, change is the constant. Look, we are changing every day. We are always asked to change. That's not the variable. The variable in this equation is the readiness. Right? So that's what's going to determine whether you're successful or not, is whether you're ready. And in this case, we had one group of people who were ready, another group of people who were not, and that created a lot of issues for us that uh, took us a few years to solve. Um, so you know, what will we do differently? Uh, maybe just do a, a culture impact study and, and, and kind of figure out what we're getting into and, and dedicate some resources to that. So uh, continuing on with the Holly Frontier journey, uh, in 2011, we find out that we are, uh, Holly Corporation and Frontier are going to merge to become Holly Frontier. Uh, interesting side note here, um, back in the early 2000s, Holly and Frontier tried to merge uh, for the first time. Uh, that attempt uh, ended in a lawsuit that Frontier filed against Holly, and Holly countersued. Uh, went to court for two weeks, and at the end of the day, and at the end of several millions of dollars in legal fees, uh, the court awarded Holly one dollar uh, from Frontier. <laughs> so, I still have, uh, you remember those commercials, the priceless commercials? I have a, in an acrylic uh, thing in my office a check that came from Frontier to Holly, and it says, you know, um, uh, it, an army of lawyers, you know, an, all week, an army of lawyers, $12 million. So, uh, all paid, uh, all expenses paid, two week vacation in Connecticut for the trial, you know, $50,000. Getting a check from Jim Gibbs, priceless. So, that was kind of how the two organizations thought of each other back then. It really wasn't until those uh, personalities left um, about 10 years later that we came back to the table. The merger just made way too much sense to do. And so that's an interesting story about how personalities and ego can kind of uh, impact some of these, uh, these mergers. Did so you, Did you cash the check? <laughs> I, I don't know. It was before I got there. So All somebody right. made up about 10 or 12 of these. And I, we were All actually right. moving the office one weekend. I was in, in some back closet, and I found that and thought, oh, I'm keeping right. this sucker. <laughs> this is a piece of corporate history. Uh, so 2011, uh, we're actually getting better about notice. So at this point in time, uh, we find out in February that we're uh, going to merge in July. So that's five months notice. That's a great luxury for us. Uh, we also find out that we're moving our uh, headquarters during that time frame as well. So I don't suggest uh, you try to move headquarters and do a merger at the same time. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty rough. Uh, so at this point, we were really uh, getting more mature in how we viewed our application landscape. And we were developing our enterprise standard applications. And then we were developing roadmaps that would show uh, our, our customers how we were going to get there. And this is an example of one of those roadmaps. This is for our refinery applications, so the applications that our engineers and operators and maintenance guys are using. And each truck on that road. Well, each road represents a different refinery's path, and each truck on that road represents a standard piece of software, and then the date on the truck that you may or may not be able to see uh, indicates when it's coming. So this was a way for us to kind of visually 
display our roadmap to our refinery customers. Uh, we also you know, had emails, we had face-to-face -face meetings, uh, we had newsletters, and so the point here is with mergers uh, in particular, the um, communication is so important. Uh, and it's really important, in my opinion, to be omni-channel and not just communicate with an email and think that that means the message has gotten across. So we tried different things like the posters that you see here. Um, another interesting thing real quick uh, before I turn it back over to Eric. So this was the first merger, and I think one of the mistakes I made going into this was assuming it was going to be just like the two acquisitions. And it was in some regards, but... Uh, in a very important way, it was different. And the way it was different is in the acquisitions, we were bringing all these employees into our company, right? Nobody was really losing their job. Uh, with the merger, you have a lot of overlap. And the synergies um, that you get from the merger, a lot of that is around headcount. And so, you know, we came in there and we were, at this point, we had had rapid integration down to a science. We were hard charging. And I remember very clearly uh, flying up to Denver for the first time and walking in that office, and very few people there were going to be part of the new company. And I could, you could have cut the tension in the air with a knife. It was, it was thick. Um, and so we were pushing for this rapid integration, but on the other end, we hadn't incented those people who were not going to be part of the future organization to participate in that rapid integration. And so we had a lot of tension there. And uh, again, if we had to do it over again, we would incentivize those people differently. Um, so that was, that was an area where we made a mistake. Um, and just, you know, mergers, it's, it's uh, the uh, people side of mergers is very, very important. Yeah. And so uh, the program or project management discipline here is really around recognizing the full end-to-end -end, uh, merger integration life cycle. And you know, if you think about, the, there's four stages in a, in a, a merger, the due diligence stage, the integration planning phase. A lot of that happens in a kind of a clean room environment. And then really a lot of the post-merger and synergy capture uh, uh, dimensions. Couple points, you know, I just had a client, one of the bigger mergers right now, where they were very focused on making sure that they were operationally ready, right? And then lo and behold, uh, additional synergy targets get handed down into IT because, you know what, we're short. We're, we're not going to hit our synergy targets. And so uh, then you're in a reactive mode where you need to push and dig and maybe do some things that you may not necessarily want to do to fulfill those synergy commitments that the company's made to justify the merger. And so in the context of uh, project management through these life cycles, it's important not only to think about the holistic journey that you're on and not just the activities that need to be uh, accomplished, but also the broader business objectives, right? We talk as IT professionals that we need to have uh, the business involved in, in these journeys to help make the decision. But also what's important is to know the business context in which you're operating, and then you can potentially seek out more deliberately and explicitly some of the dimensions that you may or may not be getting. And so having a holistic end-to-end -end view on how you're getting to the outcomes is equally as important as getting the tasks done associated with closing and, and implementing some of the changes that you need to make. Okay. So <clears throat> back to the Holly Frontier story. 2011, we had integrated very quickly. We had saved the company $30 million by being able to achieve those synergies in six months instead of 18 months. And so we were, you know, patting ourselves on the back, feeling pretty good about ourselves. And along comes the Dallas Morning News Top 100 Places to Work survey. And uh, anybody participate in that before? A few, few folks. Um, we, the IT department did not fare very well in this survey. Uh, we weren't last, but we were next to last. And uh, basically the survey was measuring people's uh, morale. What their happiness at work, their satisfaction levels. Um, and I was embarrassed. Uh, all of management saw where everybody ranked. Everybody knew that I was second from the bottom. I'd always fancied myself as, as a good leader. And so this was a direct hit to my ego. Um, after uh, getting over being embarrassed, I decided to do something about it. 
I decided to reissue the survey but allow for my IT employees to fill in comments, uh, kind of open comments. So we had this uh, survey proctored by a third party. Um, it took a few weeks, they came into my office and they laid a stack of papers about a, an inch deep full of comments on my desk. For the next two or three hours, I read through those comments and that was one of the, if not the hardest day in my professional career. Uh, reading the extent to which some of our employees that I cared about uh, very much were unhappy. Um, the good news is we found some trends, we found some themes, and we found some things that we could work on. Um, and so one of the things that the survey taught us was that our employees felt overburdened. Um, they didn't feel like there was a way to say no to incoming projects. Um, and I don't think it was a matter of, of working too many hours. Uh, you know, we could have worked 80 hours a week and still not kept up with that demand. Um, communication was an issue. Often when you do these uh, things, you find out communication is a problem. This was communication going upwards and downwards. Uh, the department felt like we weren't having enough of that. And a lot of times communication and trust go hand in hand. We did not uh, have trust between our IT folks that are out in the refineries and our IT folks that were in Dallas at the corporate headquarters. So something would happen, uh, an outage at one of the refineries, and immediately the blame game would start happening, right? Uh, they would report to Dallas, oh, you guys, what did you change? And Dallas, oh, we didn't change anything. What did you guys mess up, right? So it was a, it was a pretty bad environment, and I guess a little naive of me to assume that in a post-merger environment, your culture is just going to be top-notch. Um, but we had a lot to work on. And uh, the reason, um, well, actually, let me, let me point out. So we had a lot to work on. I put it together a team to attack this problem. I came up with the idea of the SWAT team because it sounded like very action-oriented. And uh, the, the SWAT team had one other supervisor, myself, and about nine employees that represented all the various groups and functions. Uh, we did a gap analysis on kind of where we were today versus where we wanted to be. And that gap analysis led us to the three initiatives that you see in front of you. Now, the reason I'm telling you this whole story is, um, Eric, how many times have you seen a PMO initiative come out of a culture survey? Not often. It's, it, it's rare. <laughs> most, most of the times, it's, it's a project that has gone really poorly. And, and, and don't get me wrong, we've had our, our fair share of project failures. But in general, with these high profile projects, we were getting it done. Um, but uh, what, what we were sacrificing was the happiness of our employees. So uh, we had three initiatives. The PMO was one of those initiatives. And um, as I mentioned, uh, one of the biggest complaints that we have was there's too much demand. We, yeah. can't, we don't feel like we can say no. We just feel completely overburdened. Yeah. And, and this overburdened concept is actually a fairly common one. Actually, the, one of the first questions we got was about resource availability, yep. right? And interestingly, uh, day before yesterday, I was talking to an IT team where they were saying that some of their people we're working on 50 projects simultaneously, right? And, and, and everyone, like, they discovered that this was happening, right? Obviously, it was impacting their ability to deliver each individual one, and having that many has direct implications on how tightly you can manage and execute a project. And so, you know, the, the, the way this typically comes up more directly is through the broader concept of demand management. Demand asks from the business for projects, enhancements, break, fix, incident support versus supply, your resource availability. I think generally people do a good job of having some sort of review project process at the project level to say, we will do this, we will not do that. But sometimes what you see a little bit of uh, challenge is having to tell business partners to wait, right? You're not ready. Sometimes you go through that process and you start immediately. And, you know, it just pushes out of the way some of the stuff you already had in the pipeline. And then the enhancements and uh, the break-fix activity uh, also can be a huge uh, uh, draw on your resources. Now, sometimes organizations are large enough where they'll split 
those two organizations where they'll have a dedicated pool to work on the, the break fix maintenance incidents and the enhancements, and then another pool of resources to work on the projects. You have to be kind of a little bigger to make that successful, so a lot mix. And so, uh, you know, how do you match the demand of work with the resource uh, resources availability? And detailed resource planning at a PMO level is often the mechanism where people aren't quite doing it. So if you're going to assign Eric to another project, do you know when you're doing that that he's already working on seven other things, on three other things? Or is there something so important that we want Eric and that team to focus on just one thing? And so that process of matching uh, demand and maybe having a tiered structure becomes very important, right? Usually, if a, a piece of work needs to be delivered by a team, a team lead, a you know, head of a certain uh, corporate apps or whatever, it's manageable, right? There's one leader doing the delivery. They can manage the, the work. If a particular piece of work starts to extend across different delivery groups, right? You got some. You need a little bit more from infrastructure this time. Maybe you pull, you're pulling from your data analytics group, and all of a sudden it's spreading leadership teams. There's no good way to plan the resources and ensure the availability. And depending on how you're organized, at any given point in time, you may have incidents come in that are higher priority than the project delivery, and that pushes timelines out all over the place. And so being deliberate about reserving capacity for the day-to-day -day operational stuff, the incidents, and being deliberate about how you assign resources to work and having the governance mechanism in place to tell the business they have to wait a little bit until you free up capacity becomes much more important. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because this was not our first uh, bite at the apple. We had tried to set up a PMO a couple times before, but uh, what we failed to do was dedicate any resources to it. And so this time around, uh, we had changed our mind and, cha and decided that we were going to throw some resources at it. So um, the first thing we had to do was define what's a project, though. Uh, is a project anything over 80 hours? Is a, an enhancement to an existing report a project? Uh, you know, what makes it a project? We sat down and defined that. And what we found was that we had 156 projects across three different programs, infrastructure, business apps, and refinery apps, which uh, reflects our organizational structure. Uh, again, we've already hit the demand management point. We had to have good demand management because that's where we were failing. Uh, we were not tracking time. We were not estimating how much time is for KTLO. We had resources that would be pulled off of projects for incident support. and. Uh, so anyway, that's a big issue for us. Resource management kind of goes along with that. We wanted exception-based reporting uh, to help streamline the reporting, and we wanted to eventually get into bimodal and get into agile. Uh, and finally, we had an issue, particularly at our company, with shadow IT. And so putting some structure around this process was a really good way to uh, rein them in just a little bit. <clears throat> so. These are our uh, HFC's dozen steps for success. They may not be yours. Maybe some of these, Eric, you've seen in the past, but these worked for us. The first thing we did was we hired a leader. We hired Sherry James back there. <laughs> Woo -hoo! And those of you that don't know Sherry, Sherry is awesome. Uh, <laughs> and Sherry has made my job so much easier. Um, but we hired an experienced program manager to come in and get this started. And that's something we'd never done before. Uh, so Sherry shows up. Uh, it took us a while. We got through the process. She shows up and she says, yeah, at first I really just want to attend meetings and listen and take notes. And I thought, man, ah, I'm just trying. This is a SWAT team. I want to get out there and do some <laughs> stuff, right? I want to get some action. I want to get some tasks accomplished. Uh, I want to see a dashboard or something, right? Um, and so I really doubted her approach at first, but if I would have thought back to my days as a project manager when I went out to BP, when I went out to ConocoPhillips, the first thing I did was try to get my arms around the problem by talking to people and listening to people. And so I should have relied on that knowledge, but uh, I didn't. So thank you, <laughs> Sherry. Uh, so she got an idea for what the issue was or what the problems were, and then we went out and hired some dedicated PMs. Uh, 156 projects don't lead themselves, right? Uh, so we thought we needed about three PMs 
they started building the content library, documents, processes, tools, et cetera, that we we're going to use in our methodology. Um, and then we started really building relationships with the business. I think Sherry traveled to three of our refineries, uh, spent time with HR, spent time with procurement. Uh, she was like the one person social committee for the uh, IT department. So Nelson, on the business, are they formally assigned to your projects? So that's a great question. Um, and the business does not track time to the level, well, they don't track time. And so we are doing that now in IT. And so when we are forecasting our time on a project, we can tell yeah. whether there are allocation issues. Um, with the business, the best we can do right now is say we need X number of hours from this resource per week, 20, 40, 10, whatever. And you're going to have to commit to that. And if you can't, we're going to have to you know, tap the brakes and, and stop the project. Mm -hmm. So that's been a way we've kind of gotten around that. Um, maybe in the future, others will have kind of time tracking. We can just really put everything into one single system. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, we went out and documented the projects. We picked a tool uh, to manage all this stuff. Um, we started small. We started with a few key projects. We started with a project that was a big visible cost savings project, so we wanted to get some speed into that. Uh, we started with a very uh, damaged project that was really in the ditch I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, so we started small, but we very quickly built to all. At this point, 100% of our IT projects are in the PMO, are in our tool, and are being managed. And that's the first time I can say that in nine years in my role. So thank you, Sherry. Um, we, were so, we were a victim of our own success. We were so successful, we had more demand. We went out and hired another PM. And this time, we hired a PM that had agile experience and, and an agile background. We had tried to get into to Agile before. Uh, we'd sent some of our kind of waterfall project folks to Scrum training. And uh, then we came back and tried to do our own version of Scrum training without ever seeing how it really goes. And uh, it's really important to hire somebody. If you're going to get into that, you need to hire somebody who has experience, not just the knowledge. Um, we do uh, biweekly status meetings, one for executives and one for everybody. Um, we've added in functionality over time. We didn't do resource management on day one. Uh, that was not the first thing we did, but we rolled that in in the, in the last couple of months. And then lastly, but certainly not least, uh, this is all about people. Um, Sherry came in and talked about people first, and I want to listen. How can I help? Um, reward the people. Celebrate successes. Um, you really have to do that to generate the momentum that's going to carry you through those uh, tough times. So that's what worked for us. Uh, uh, you know, here, Eric, I don't know if you have any thoughts, if you've seen kind of patterns at other clients. Yeah, I, I think um, with the skill mix continues to change, right? Uh, agile, people are asking IT to deliver a faster time to market. And I think a lot of folks are looking at, you know, how can I improve with Agile? And this point that you made, Nelson, I think is spot on in that you can't expect people doing SDLC their entire career to flip over to Agile, right? It is a different mix of skills within the individual people, and, um, and it's not a change that happens overnight. And you know, I, I think of a client that recently, um, or recently, they decided to, to step into Agile by launching the biggest program they'd ever undertaken using Agile methodology, right? <laughs> Big one, parallel teams, doing all sorts of stuff. That didn't go too well. Uh, and when they were done, they ended up calling the methodology within their company fragile, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, you know, really getting the right skills assigned to the projects for the needs of that project and kind of differentiating that is, is quite important. You don't, you don't even want to hear all the acronyms I've heard for SAP <laughs> uh, throughout my project experience. Uh, you know, we talked about communication when we talked about mergers. It's also very important when you're uh, rolling out a PMO. Uh, this is one example. We put out a newsletter, um, and this is uh, a tips and tricks section from that newsletter. You'll see another section in a little bit. Uh, but we also had training. We had training, uh, formal training, uh, like three-day training or four-day training, and we also had some kind of just intro to project management 101 for some of our stakeholders. Again, that omni-channel communication, I think, is very important. Yeah. And so when we, when we go back and look at you know, what all falls within the program management or PMO structure, there's like a handful of tools, right? 
The first is you know, just the basic structuring and resourcing and planning of the program, right? And so uh, you know, getting the right resources in place, using the charter, right? And I recently talked to a client who'd been working on a project for four years. They had created a charter at the beginning but had never gone back to it. It just sat on the shelf, right? And in the context of kind of managing, and changes had been, it been approved, and, but they did not have a mechanism to look at it end to end. They never refreshed it. So these should be living, breathing documents, right? The, the, inter, the master plan around what you're trying to do, also equally critical with, depending on the size of the project, you may want to put it under formal change control. And then just prioritizing how you work through that. The benefits tracking, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but having a line of sight into why are you doing what you are doing? What is the outcome that I'm trying to achieve? It's not just whether I hit the task by the date that I committed to hitting, but what's the why? What's the business reason? If I go back to the, to the session this morning about uh, the brain and how the brain works, right? Am I myopically focused on the activity and working out through the detail, or do I have visibility into the broader context of why I'm doing what I'm doing, and can I justify that? Then risk management, of course, very, very important. And I think that one of the, the pitfalls I see here is people try to convey that everything is under control, right? They don't want to necessarily expose the problems. Now, anyone who's lived in this business for any amount of time knows that there are always problems, right? And so the experienced leader will dig in a little bit because they're not hearing enough bad news. There has to be some, right? But it's really a mechanism not only to, to track issues and risks, but also to get help and to mitigate those and to have visibility and line of sight into how you're doing overall. And then lastly, the change management and communications. Very important. I mentioned <laughs> my very first job was uh, working to put in systems to help power plants run more efficiently, right? So this was in 1992, right? Here comes Eric as a young man trying to train, you know, 60-year-old power plant operators, right, <laughs> on how to new use a new system. They never used a system before. One guy sitting, you know, sitting there and his buddy leans forward and says, they're trying to push you out, Earl, right? <laughs> now, times have changed but the sentiment continues to exist. And so being deliberate and explicit and understanding how people react to the work that you're doing is, is very important to get the benefits and the outcomes that you want. How are we doing, quick time check? How are we doing on time? I think we have 10 minutes. So should we maybe yeah, let's skip. kind of get into questions? Uh, just real, I'll hit these real quick. Uh, results for our PMO. Uh, they drove savings of a million dollars a year on a cost savings initiative uh, within their first year. Um, I mentioned the critical project they pulled out of the ditch um, and got it back on track. This is one that I had very low confidence in us ever seeing the light of the day, and uh, we're actually on track for a mid-October go live. Um, I mentioned that the adoption's been a lot faster. We actually have other business units that are uh, using the PPM tool, using our processes and methodologies. Um, and then finally, uh, Getting back to the survey, uh, we've actually done that survey again. Uh, we've actually, actually done it a couple more times since then. And I'm proud to say that uh, the PMO has definitely improved morale uh, within our department. So that's just an incredible result. Um, and with that, why don't we just go into questions? Sure. So. Sherry? Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> These are the kudos for Sherry. PMO for me has been a dynamic tool, one that keeps me organized, focused, and informed. So. Hi, thank you very much. This is very timely because on Monday we start our annual strategic planning and I'm supposed to give a presentation on our version of a PMO. So, mm -hmm. uh, well, I did have a question on what repository did you use to track IT time? Uh, that is a great question. We are allocating the time in uh, the Clarison tool in terms of actually capturing. I believe we may have, uh, Sherry, you know for SAP, they, they have a custom tool they're using to capture? Okay, they're using Clarison to capture as well. Okay, sorry, so we're using Clarison for both of those. 
One I see often is a tool called Clarity for resource planning and time tracking. Somebody's coming on that. Just uh, wanted to ask, uh, you just touched on benefits tracking and how you calculate it. Are, are there any tools or, I don't know, you guys both have consulting backgrounds, so how do you get to that ROI benefits, uh, cost savings type stuff? Uh, for you. us right now, it's, it's not quite as sophisticated as you might imagine. Uh, it, usually it starts with conversations with um, the business leader that's responsible. You know, two kind of flavors here. There, there's some things that are very, very quantifiable, right, and easy to prove in numbers, and nobody argues as long as your math is right. And there are other things that people know their value in, but it's just more difficult to quantify for whatever reason. And so for those cases, what we try to do is go talk to the business leader and, and just ask them, what do you think this means to your organization? What, what uh, is it going to impact? What can, what can we measure that it will impact? And have them commit to... Uh, communicate, yes, I think this is, is actually providing value, here's why, and here's what I think that value looks like in this kind of range. And so that's how we've tried to get some of those more qualitative things into a more quantitative discussion, and you really rely on the credibility of the business unit leader that you're working for. Yeah. Just, uh, just to build on that, I think the, the specificity around the, ch so benefits tracking versus benefits realization, right? Benefits tracking, I think there are a lot of tools that allow you to do it well. But the successful benefit realization comes from what Nelson said up front, which is being specific about the change that you're going to put in or enable that results in, this, in whatever benefits. Improve revenue, reduce cost in the business, in IT, and uh, knowing what the change is so that when the change happens, you know the dollars will flow. Often people will judge or get approval for projects by saying, hey, you know, Nelson, if, uh, if I give you this tool, what do you think? Can you give me like 10% savings? And he goes, yeah, sure, I'll give you 10% savings. That number never goes anywhere except in the business case, and no one sees it again, right? I had one client with big stuff. The CFO would get involved, right? And he would come in and say, okay, guys, this has a million dollars of cost savings. That's coming out of budgets, in 18 months, when you say, I'm going to get this money, right? It's coming out. We're going to track it. You're going to be over budget if you don't get these savings. Now, that was a great way, if you ever become CFOs, to see whether people actually believe their business case, right? right? So. <laughs> That's great. Um, so your SWAT team has corrected a few of the issues that you've discovered. What do you see as the next steps of your PMO throughout your maturity? Uh, really, for us, the next step would be to consolidate and across the, integrate across the entire enterprise. Um, I mentioned some of the back office and even our pipeline company have kind of gotten on board with this. Uh, we still have a large segment of the business at the refineries and, quite frankly, where we spend most of our capital dollars because these are big projects, big asset-intensive projects. Uh, so getting into that area and getting everybody on the same platform would be the next step for us. We've taken a bit of an organic approach so far. Hopefully we get to a critical mass where we can say, hey, this is not just the IT standard anymore. This is the enterprise standard. I have a question for you. Mm. Uh, I heard you say <coughs> early on, like a hammer. Yes. Then later on, I said, if I heard you right, that one of the benefits you expected from all these mergers was reduction in people. Yes. Hammer and reduction in people go kind of hand in hand. How did you manage the attitude and the motivation of people who probably had an idea what was going on? That's a great question, and there's a lot more art to that than science. Um, one thing we had going for us in our specific case was uh, the office that most of the people were let go from or the office that had, some of them had options to come to Dallas, they lived in Denver. And I don't know if you guys have, have know people in Denver. Uh, they never leave Denver, right? And so that helped us because people didn't see that future, but it actually created some problems for us in, in that people had 
uh, you know, a little bit of a short-term mentality. And it's just human nature, right? You're going to be without a job. So, again, I think we should have, uh, if I had to do it all over again, I would have been a little more sensitive to that uh, going into it and, and at least understood and listened a little more and, and uh, not just push, push, push on the schedule. My question is about the survey and what drove the survey. So was this an annual survey that you always send out to the business for just health check? Or was this specifically an IT survey because of attrition or some other reason? So initially the survey was to see where we ranked in the uh, Dallas Morning News Top 100. Um, we did not make it there, and so we haven't officially done that survey again. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, if you can't win, why try? But. Um, <laughs> We have, in IT, taken that same survey and repeated it twice now, uh, again, with the open comments. So we've, uh, it's, it's, for the last two years, it's really just been an IT tool uh, to measure that satisfaction of employees. And I feel like there must have been a more of a story to your PMO people first. Is there anything you can share with us? Uh, you know, I guess when, when Sherry went around and listened to everybody, uh, a lot of our problems were not necessarily process or tool-based, although you know, we didn't really have a good tool at first. But a lot of the issues that we were trying to solve were around people. If we put people first, uh, we thought that everything else would kind of come in after that. And it's, it's, it's worked. Um, uh, Sherry's done a great job. I, honestly, I never would have thought we would be as far as we are today. Um, and I had some pretty high expectations, but uh, uh, it, it's, been, uh, it's, it's been a great approach to put the people first. So. Okay. Great. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, <laughs> We're not done yet. Uh, the other thing that hit me is, and you know, in all these mergers in oil business, and the price going from $100 a barrel to $30 a barrel. You must have had a lot of nervousness going well, on. Well, so for us in downstream, it's not only about the price of crude, it's how the price of crude relates to the price of gasoline, uh -huh. for the most uh -huh. part. In our industry, that's called the crack spread. And uh, so, you know, last year, that low oil price helped us. Um, our raw material price was low, and because of low gasoline price, demand went up. SUV sales hit record highs last year. Um, only 125,000 electric cars sold last year. <laughs> 25,000 SUVs sold a day in the United States. Anyway, just a quick stat. But uh, this year has been a much different uh, experience. The, there's been an oversupply of gasoline on the market, and so those, those, those spreads have uh, narrowed. Yeah. So we don't necessarily want high prices at the pump. I'm happy with $2 gasoline as long as the price of crude is low enough for us to make money, so. <laughs> well, that's great. We really appreciate the insight in the changing world and changing businesses. And Thank you. Else. And that's Thank you. one of our applications for the time we spent in. And Thank you very much. Great to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat>